that. Only an auditor at the city can expand that. And so if, if you want to expand your city limits because of growth, then the government would come in and audit your land use and tell you where you are underutilized so you could build within a certain area instead of expanding. So, I mean, that won't fly here. But, but this sprawl idea, uh, you know, the Z Home project over in Issaquah, it's uh, <coughs> close to net zero, and people came in and bought that. And it was, I think, about a 15% premium over other housing. Um, so, so there is a market if, if we could get developers uh, to actually put up types of buildings, whether it's residential, multifamily, or whatever. There, there are individuals who will actually pay a premium, uh, but, that, but we still kind of live in this society of I want my own backyard, and I don't want to share that backyard, and I don't want to share a building. That, that, that's a difficult issue. We, we do have this um, misperception about density when you're thinking about residential density in particular, that, that it is a huge set of office towers. I went in actually this morning and searched for dense communities in the United States, and, and I got the, the most dense 150, and more than 100 of them I had never heard of. Right? It's a different kind of approach to density, and, and there are these six-story, seven-story, eight-story buildings that are where you have the most dense communities all the way around the world. New York City is number five, and number four is Hoboken. Who would have thought that Hoboken was more dense than, than New York? Uh, the next one that I've heard of is Boston, that's 51. Next one after that is Chicago, 59. Density doesn't necessarily, doesn't ordinarily mean office towers, but if you're gonna have these eight-story buildings, and you're not looking at it just monomaniacally about how much energy does the building use, but how much energy does the community use, you really have to tie that to walkable communities, bike bikeable, and you have to have decent public transport. But if you've got that, then suddenly you've got a whole urban ecosystem that's much more efficient. Yes, I mean, this is a tough one. Right? We have such a slow affair with cars. I mean, nobody's driving a car and driving wherever, whatever. And uh, you know, we're going to have to think about how we can make it more You know, one, one thing that can catalyze this is, is big centers of employment building mixed-use uh, environments. So, you know, Google, for example, is, is planning a new campus where there will be mixed residential office retail space all in the same place. Um, so no huge office towers, but it's, it's, it's sort of designed from the beginning so that you can walk to most of the things that you need to do in your life as opposed to, you know, driving 30 miles back and forth to, to your house. So do, at this point, right now, do prospective tenants and homeowners value sustainable practices in their buildings to a greater degree than real estate investors and developers? Who, who drives who drives the demand more? <coughs> Raise your hand if you value. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, I think they're. Uh, you know, that's one of the great things about the Northwest. We have an aware community that's really working hard on it. So I, so I think as consumers, we do value it. Uh, the challenge is how you, how you actually put what is the value if you're looking for a financial value. Um, yeah, the, it, it really is a, a, a carrot and a stick kind of thing. You have to convince the developer that there's a market for the building before they'll build it, and you have to have the building before you can demonstrate that there's a market. And we've now done that up through the lead phase. And if, if you're, well, certainly today in Portland, if, if you decide to put up a lead platinum building, there's going to be sign-up lists to try to get into it. Um, the next big step is to move to the living building. These things that are self-sufficient for energy, self-sufficient for water, have nothing toxic in them, where uh, it, it, it remains to be seen what what that market will be like. Um, we have we had at one point a fully leased building, and uh, we now have two floors that are available. And it had nothing to do with the fact that it was a living building. Uh, it's that um, a tenant had the great good fortune to be doing really well financially and was able to merge with another company and no longer do we have enough space for them, which is a really not subtle way of letting you all know that. You're looking for office space. <laughs> and, and in order to prove the demand, we would love to have you approach me after the meeting today to discuss it. Um, I, I think that the demand is, is real, but you really do have to have both sides willing to take a little bit of a risk on this. The, the people that come into our building are not going to be doing it in a way that is risk-free. We have an independent water district. 
There's Seattle is a water district. The Bullock Building is another water district because we'll be the first commercial building in the United States to be using the rainwater that falls on its roof for all purposes, potable drinking water, showers, what have you. You wouldn't believe what we have to do to treat that water. That is the purest water in the world when it comes up. Um, but we wanted to do it because, and, and I'm sorry, I'm rattling on, but you might say, well, why? We're up to our gills of water around here. But our water is dependent on snowpack, and the snowpack is decreasing every year. The population is increasingly moving here because they perceive us as having a lot of water. We can't build, really, realistically, any more dams up in the Cascades. And I defy anybody to try to build a new dam in the Cascades. So we've got to get someplace else for reservoirs, and I think there should be cisterns and buildings all around the area. But you can't decide 30 years from now, man, we need to have 2,000 cisterns that's infinitely cheaper to put in the system when you're building the building that you back and try to retrofit. So uh, the only way that will happen is if there is a demand for these things. And I'm praying that we're going to be able to show that there's a demand. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll open the forum up to the audience. If you could effectively change or enact one specific policy tomorrow um, to propagate better built environments, what would it be? And 20 years from now, how would society be different as a result? Hmm. This is the 30,000 foot thing, so yeah. So, um, let's see, I'm not sure how specific to get, but I think a, a combination of, a, of an aggressive um, code target, like what California has with net zero by 2020 for new buildings, uh, combined with uh, changes in, in zoning law, essentially, to, to kind of encourage and incentivize these more uh, environments uh, would probably be the two things that I would go for. But as far as actually getting that done, it's a, it's a political nightmare, right? Yeah, I would, uh, <coughs> I would take the flag and actually put the built environment on a performance track um, around total water use and total energy use by type of building and geography or whatever, it, and then change the utility construct so that is the mechanism uh, that accesses financing at scale uh, to actually do the work in the buildings and have the utility have the long-term relationship with the building, not the current owner. Which was, of course, my suggestion. Uh, so I'm a little bit adrift now, but maybe I'll throw in one more that once you've got a building right now, you're, you've got it. And uh, it may be built and flipped three years later once you've got it fully tenanted to an insurance company or something and it just endures. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have something that any time that a building changes ownership, that it have to be brought up to a revised code so that you, you at that point, not necessarily as high as a new building, you probably can't get that high, but you're, you're not locked in forever. The, the reason for that is that when you're refinancing a building, that is the time you get really long-term financing and you can make all of these investments and make far more economic <coughs> sense if it's part of your long-term loan uh, than it is if you're doing it on something that's three-year money or five-year money. Questions? Boss. So I wanted to follow up on, I was going to ask your question, Andrew, but since that was already asked, I'll, I'll Actually, that was Dennis's question. He just, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so since that's already been asked, what policy? I'm going to go out on a limb here and predict that after all the votes are counted, we're going to have a governor in this state who actually wrote a book on clean energy and energy efficiency, and who is going to have majorities in both House and Senate, uh, and is going to want to be doing some things in this area. But I'll also say that um, when we talk to legislative leadership in particular, there's very little understanding that clean energy or the efficiency area or building green buildings is a real industry, that there's real employment, real economic power here. And um, very the, the aspirations, let's say, are not appropriately scaled to the need and the opportunity. I'm interested in your thoughts on what we can be doing to raise our game in Olympia and actually implement the policies that you just talked about. So this, this won't be very specific, but there is, uh, of all of the clean tech, green jobs stuff, you can make the strongest case 
in, in the building area for a jobs economic development. 